Welcome to Mind Over Matter, where we feature young Jamaicans who are shooting for the stars. I'm your host, Margaret Boyne. My guest is a mathematician and a teacher who is presently pursuing a PhD in engineering. Hailing from Greenwich Farm, his early childhood was tough, one of poverty, but his story is one of inspiration that tells us that we are not limited by our circumstances. My guest is Ramon Jackson. Welcome to Mind Over Matter, Ramon. It's a pleasure mm -hmm. having you. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure being here as well. You're presently pursuing a PhD in, in engineering, um, which is a far cry from your early days in Greenwich Farm. Can you tell me a little about your childhood? Um, what was your living conditions like? Uh, my childhood, my living conditions. All right, so... I don't know where do I start, but let's <laughs> start at um, the beginning. <laughs> let's start at the beginning, right? Yes. Um, so originally, um, I'm from downtown Kingston, really, um, East Queen Street. There, I spent the first six years of my life. I was living with my father and some siblings and three women at the time. So that's what I'm. Um, I was seeing. What do you mean by three women at the time? Well, um, <laughs> That's all I can say. We had that three I'm women one. living with. <laughs> yes, yeah, three women really? living in the house at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I don't know. But that was the living situation. Um, but um, what happened now? So my mother left from the location, wanted to leave him, and of course she decided that she's not going to leave me with him. And as such, she took me and then we moved to Greenwich Farm where most persons would know my life to be. Even in to go to Greenwich Farm was not an easy one because she didn't have anywhere to go really. She didn't have a place for herself to go. So what happened was that she went back to her mother's house where we were just sleeping on the floor until she found something <laughs> where somewhere that we could live. Um, and, and let me interject here. Um, when you're saying your mother, it's not your biological mother. It's, it's one of your father's um, girlfriend who left him. Yes, yes. But um, she's the only person I've seen all my right. days. So literally, yeah. it becomes natural as mother. Um, yeah. But yes, you are correct. It's not my biological mother, but she has had me since I was about three or six months, somewhere along mm -hmm. that line. No, um, it's really my mother, right? Yes, she is. It's that. So I have to leave a Carl for him wherever I go because you know mm -hmm. she's absolutely phenomenal. So she so while we were there, I still tried to go to school and everything until she found somewhere. She found somewhere I was known living with her and one of her daughters, of course, my sister. And that's where we grew up. My sister was going to high school at the time. I was going to primary school. I've never seen my mother work a day in her life. I've never seen her with a new boyfriend, so to speak. <laughs> really? So how did she manage to um, provide? That's, um, that's a secret that only <laughs> she had. And <laughs> I've been trying to find out for years because if she can do it, like... I think anybody can do it, but mm -hmm. it's it's true. It's still strange to me up to now. So every time I try to ask her, "How did you do it? Like, what happened to you?" That's it. Um, <laughs> she don't know either. But um, so she not working. She not having a boyfriend to say here. I still trying to figure out how she did it. But um, with what she could do, what she did, or whatever happened. We tried to get lunch money to go to school. She tried to give us lunch money to go to school. There are times where the only thing she could give us is just bus here to go. And that's what we did. So we get the bus here to go and then we just walk from school. I was going to Maxfield Park Primary at the time. My sister was going to Norman Monday High School at the time. So we were just a stone throw away from each other. Of course, one of the things is that she would give my bus here to go and come one and two days. And that was twenty dollars at the time for bus fare or taxi fare. So what I would do is take the twenty dollars to go to school, and then use the other twenty dollars to buy the bag of bula, the Nutribullah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Buy the Nutribullah and then walk home, 
And then now mommy and I and my sister would have something to eat. Oh, for a couple yeah. of the days. So that's what I would do. I don't tell her that's about it. Walk home, but of course, mm-hmm. if she sees me, she would be like, you're my mm-hmm. you walk. <laughs> Yes. But I went to walk home with, so it was, it was really, was really okay for me to just do that. Um, I hear that they cut out Nutribula now, which, which makes me sad because, I mean, persons like me and other person, yeah. persons like we're me, we're dependent on Nutribula, we were heavily dependent on it. So to hear that they cut it out, it's really sad. But, um, so that happened, continuing like from my primary school days now, there would be a lot of violence, especially around like the holiday time. So like the Christmas time, some violence would happen or pop up out of nowhere. I don't know if it was for me, no violence would be there, but mm-hmm. violence would pop up every now and then. So that would force us to really stay inside, not going anywhere. There was this one particular incident. It didn't happen to me, it happened to my a friend of mine at the time where he was just coming from school, primary school, just the same. And a man looked at him and told him, say, yo, going out of the road now, mm. as you want to start anything, and we don't want you out here when nothing start. And I was like, hmm, but man back then had some principle about it. Oh. What's up? Today, not saying that I'm promoting, but right, I understand. I'm saying, yeah, yeah that then what's happening now, and those are some of the things that we had to go through. Um, a lot of times we want to study, a lot of times we want to play, we just have to lay on our bellies under our beds or lock up in our bathrooms, just trying to get away from all of that. Mm. So, that's that's but, kind but, of but Ramona. With mm-hmm. with all that violence around you, how did you um, manage to keep away from that kind of, you know, as they would say, badness? How did I keep away from the badness? Um, I tried to use school as an escape. Not that I was going to school to do work, because three quarters of the time I'm at school, I'm not doing any work. <laughs> um, I use school as an escape because I wouldn't see anybody digging out their hand middles, as we would say, or anybody just drinking liquor. Uh, just being an environment where everybody is just okay. And of course, at Excelsior, where I attended high school, it made everything seem so okay because everybody seemed to be on the one playing field. You didn't. It wasn't a case where you could say, okay, those persons are rich or those persons are poor. Mm-hmm. You are never treated differently despite your background. So I kind of like that at Excel. So, um, so that's what I did. I used that as an skill. Well, you mentioned Excel. So how, what, you know, what was that experience like? What did you do at school? All right, Excelsior, my experience, my experience was, it was great, actually. Um, went to Excelsior. I started out dancing, of course. I love dancing. So I remember. But, I remember like a dancer at all. I might send for some videos, maybe. Or I make a video sometime in the future. Yes. We could do a dance performance, maybe. Let's see. <laughs> Um, I remember in grade seven, I had this friend, Kimali, where he discovered that Excelsior had a dance club at the time, and I was like, dance club? So how come I don't know about it? <laughs> so Kimali brought me there after school, and I realized what was happening. It was mostly upper school people, grade 10 and grade 11 people that were there at the time, and they were like, no, we don't want nobody else, so we are bringing new people. I'm like, okay. So I was going to take up my bag to leave, <laughs> and then I hear music start playing. Of course, I can't tell myself once I hear music. My feet are moving. <laughs> my body just moved. So I think it was Nol- 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 one of those songs, are Sweep. And after I finished dancing at the time and the music stopped, I took up my body. Like, no, where are you going? When you want to go to the music, come here to dance with us. And so, so that's really where my life started at Excelsior, um, dancing. Um, then at grade nine, I was trying to impress this young lady, of course. I don't have money. I don't have a respect <laughs> to speak. So what I tried to do was to use mathematics to get her attention. Okay. At the time. <laughs> so in home, I was doing so many different problems. I would reword problems that was given to me by the teacher. I would create my own problems just to solve them 
just so that I can learn enough so I can teach her. Oh, um, what what one woman can do, as I would say. <laughs> <laughs> what one woman can do, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I still didn't get her attention. She really? <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, but um, <laughs> um, I have heard the thing for all of this bit. Yeah. <laughs> that focus and determination that I put in the mathematics really <laughs> got me to where I am now. Yes. So I did the math, I did the dancing, and then you now I got into student leadership at that point. Mm-hmm. When I was in sixth form, I was also a part of the school challenge with steam. Okay. In my, kept in the school challenge with steam in my final year at Excelsior. So I was very involved. It's a, it was a very well rounded experience for me. So I like that experience at Excelsior. Okay. So when did you actually start teaching? When did I actually start teaching professionally or no, at school? That really started in grade 10 at Excelsior, where they saw what I was doing. They saw that I was comfortable with the material. And then two of the teachers knew my situation. So they were like, okay, come and teach this these students and you know, you get a little money and can bring yourself to school tomorrow. So that was kind of the situation. So I really started teaching at grade 10 and I also sat math in grade 10. So mm-hmm. teaching students that were going to sit math in grade 10, teaching myself results come out. I got a two and a lot of persons that I talk got ones and they're like, oh, this person be a new teacher. <laughs> oh, it is not fair. And I'm like, so guys, I am not crying. Like, why are you crying for me? I'm like, you guys, so that's good. I'm okay with that. And it felt good at that time to say persons that I was in the yes. past. Right, yeah. And mm-hmm. I believe it was at that point where I said, hmm, this teaching thing isn't so bad. Yeah. So at that point, I turned my focus away from actuarial science where I was seeing a lot of praise and a lot of money going towards that particular um, career field. I was like, hmm, this teaching thing not so bad. So I'm going to do the teaching. Okay. So that was how you were able to pay like probably um, your exam fees or how, how was that paid? I don't know why it was paid. <laughs> to be honest, I don't. But what I can say, I remember when I was in grade 11 and we came around, but I was very good there on that. So I came up to school at the time to call it the voucher. I came to five times in the entire time that I was there. I <laughs> called it the time and ceremony to, come, to see me get some trophies. That's that. But um, so she took the voucher and on her way from Excel, so going to she would my father to say, Yes, yeah, so right. Well, go on. Yes, so Madam Munir. And it had eight subjects on it at the time. And he was like, well, in two, right? Make him drop some of the subjects because I can't. And the money. You can't, yeah. For it. My mother was like, that makes no sense. Okay. <laughs> you don't need to contribute to it. I will start it all. Remember, I know. Not a word. I've never seen her with a boyfriend, so to speak. Something happened. My fees were paid. And I got to see the subjects. In so that's what happened for me. Okay. Um, previously mentioned um, that your father had passed um, later. How yes. did that affect you? My father passed January in grade 11. Um, it really affect, it affected me negatively because my father and I kind of had, we had a good relationship despite what transferred yeah. to my mother. Um, I would still try to go to him and, you know, talk or whatever. Or sometimes when I know mommy don't have it, what I do, I just stop by there and say, mm, what's your what a something? Yeah. Do something. <laughs> yeah. So one or two times he would give me money and I'll go to school. And I was like, okay, cool. So we had a good relationship. And the reason why it even cut me so much is because I was there the day that he died. Mm. Um, so I was at school the day I didn't feel good for whatever reason I was supposed to see in the morning but I didn't stop so I went straight to school so while being at school there was this bad feeling and I was like this this is strange this is weird so I went to the school nurse and the nurse can I get a pass to go home and 
So the nurse wrote the pass and I was leaving. 88 came, 88 would drive through Guinea Town. That's the bus. Um, taxis came that would drive through Guinea Town. And I didn't go on any of them. Mm-hmm. But the 83 came. So I went on the 83. And the 83 was there, went down. And then right when the bus was on Victoria Avenue, um, going down to East Queen Street, I mind just said, stop and come off the bus. So I stopped and come off the bus and go over and I saw that we were talking a little bit and then I fell asleep. I was trying to learn a new song that just came out from Massive at the time. So I was listening to <laughs> repeating this song in my head over and over and I fell asleep only to wake up to screams, and I'm like, um, yeah, this much nice than the house. What's happening? Mm-hmm. So she's like, murder, somebody help. And I'm like, Okay, so I went around the room now and I saw my father lying flat on his back. So it's like, okay, you can stop the lines and go find somebody to help me lift him up. Me alone can lift him up. So she went for somebody to help me to lift him up and put him in the car. And after I put him in the car and I got dressed, that bad feeling went away that I had. I'm not sure why, but mm-hmm. went away at that particular point. So the next day, I was at school and I was in math class because mm-hmm. I'm close with my math teacher, which is Lee Moore Jarrett at the time. One of the best math teachers at Texas. So one of one of of course. <laughs> um, so I was talking to him at the time and I was telling him that, you know, say yesterday this happened. Mm-hmm. And in the middle of that conversation, my phone started ringing, my sister calling me. So by the time I could walk away from the decks, I was about midway the front of the classroom. She said, "He never make it. Drop out. Mm. One drop out of me and then chill out. Everybody was like, what's happening with Ramon? We're not used to Ramon like this. Ramon is dancing, he's upbeat, he's vibrant. Like, what is this new thing? So that's when my teacher took me to the guidance council and I was just sitting in the office crying endlessly. I had no clue Mm-hmm. What I was what I was just trying, I was bawling and I was hollering and I don't know whatever other word or I don't know which other word I could use to express what I was going through at that time. But um they did the autopsy and said that he suffered a heart attack, suffered from a heart attack. Mm-hmm. So I was like, ah so that really affected me. Um and it affected me negatively, as I said, because I wasn't able to complete a lot of the SBAs that I was supposed to complete. And so I had accounts SBA, I had business SBA, because I did. I was doing business and sciences because I was really on the path of becoming an actor. So a lot of these SBAs were not going in, a lot of these labs were not being done. Dancing was on pause because I couldn't find. Yeah, vibe. I was like, ah, but somewhere as the months went on, I found a little bit of strength to push through to get the SBA sorted out, to get the labs done. And I met Darren Fraser coming closer to the end of grade 11. And Darren Fraser, which everybody now knows as my father, was really one of those persons who helped me to push through to get everything done. Yeah and finish off Excelsior, do we have finish. Okay, so he was um, first like a mentor? Um, he was a brand, he was just a stranger at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing I knew about him was that he was the other admat teacher in the school. I just know about Mr. Jarrett, and of course I've been, Mr. Jarrett has been teaching me grade 9, grade 10, and grade 11. So when I heard Mr. Fraser know, I was like, okay, this is a new teacher. So I only met him once when we were doing the SB. I did not talk to him after. Mm. So like close to the exam now, I think I walked in. I saw math going on in the IT lab. He was teaching some six formers. And the math looked familiar to me. It was some calculus. Mm. So I went into the classroom. At the time, brown shirts were considered bulla shirts and <laughs> white shirts white shirts. So the bulla shirts you know going into the classroom and Said, oh, um, just do that, do that, do that. Yeah, that easy. <laughs> and of course, um, 
I wasn't a hundred percent right, but the concept was there. Mm. So at that point, Mr. Fraser saw me like, hmm, you know, we can can work with this young man and see what can come up with. So that's kind of where it started. So it started out as just mentoring, as you said, a stranger mentor, and then you no, know, he's my father. Okay. You know? yeah, so that's where we are now. Oh, so you actually left um left your neighborhood at that time, Greenwich Farm? Uh, I didn't we were leave, still living there. Um, I was still there, but uh, I didn't leave Greenwich Farm until six form. Okay. Like six mm-hmm. form. That's when I left so I could get a change of scenery, so mm-hmm. to speak. But of course, I visited, I visited frequently. It was like I was still living there. Yeah. Okay. Much. You did your first degree at um, University of the West Indies. How did you finance your education so of course i couldn't turn to mommy to say mommy, <laughs> to pay tuition because if mommy couldn't give me lunch money <laughs> she to pay tuition. and of course that even though daddy was there i did not want to burden him but of course i still got no idea what was happening but of course daddy daddy knowing what he knows as he is very involved and he tries to research a lot he always tries to help people so he found a bunch of scholarship at the time the ministry of education had just revamped some scholarships for, for teachers that they wanted to put in the industry so i was like okay let's apply for this scholarship and then um my mp member of parliament at the time for my constituency was Professor miller and she heard of the things that i had achieved and said okay i want to meet him Okay. So, um, and meeting with her, um, she had agreed to pay my tuition mm, for the year. Awesome. So I was like, okay, all right, things seem to be working out, I guess. So I can definitely do this. So I was now able to afford accommodation because she was like, okay, no way I'm letting you stay in the community. I think you'll have a better life. Mm-hmm. living on campus you will have a more rounded experience on campus if you're living there so i moved on taylor um a little bit after but i was still hesitant as to whether or not i wanted to live on campus so i remember august 31st 2015 when that was the first day of viewing so i went to you i was supposed to meet with um i was supposed to meet with Portia that day again so i left Left you with, go to the meeting, and then I had to go back for a class in the evening. I was like, <laughs> this is not it. This is not it. So I just left and I said, okay, okay, I want to board now. So I want to board. <laughs> so I moved on the next day. Of course, I didn't have much to move on with. Mm. So I moved on, on just a sheet. And two pieces of clothes because I didn't have much. Much, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what that did, even though I had the scholarships no paying for my tuition, I still didn't want to say, "Mommy, I know me lunch money, or Daddy, I know me lunch money." Mm-hmm. I was like, "Okay, what can I now do?" And I got a job on campus um, at Jamaica Tertiary Education Commission (JTEC) where that actually helped me to like finance my day-to-day living okay working there and that kind of helped me so the scholarship was doing that and i was working there so that was covering so i was no kind of on the verge of saying okay i think i can survive this adult life i guess <laughs> 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 so, so i worked that could help me to buy clothes so i can go to school and of course because i'm being trained as a teacher i could not just wear regular t-shirt and jeans pants to school or shorts or whatever they were wearing had to wear shirt and tie and pants which oh, okay. I did. Mm-hmm. so i had to buy those stuff so i worked and financed myself throughout that particular period of course daddy would try to do his stuff and i would say daddy not pressure yourself come on let me you know but where i definitely couldn't that it was like okay now that you're finished being stubborn here <laughs> <laughs> so um so ramon what was your motivation um did, did did you use um poverty as as a fuel 
We don't use poverty. To be honest to you, um, I don't think I'm sure what the motivation was at the time. Mm -hmm. But I know after reaching like my third year, that's when I went to teaching practice at Jamaica College. And by being a teaching practice, doing, I think I did great, I guess, because I was just offered a job right at the end of teaching practice. I guess I was doing something good. Mm -hmm. So while working there at JC, talking to the students, trying to push them, trying to motivate them, it's the conversations I had with these students that really said, okay, I need to be doing more. So even though I was saying, okay, I'm being a teacher, I'm really impacting some lives. They're like, but sir, all you want to talk to me and you are just a teacher because a lot of persons really look down on the profession. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I was like, okay, what can I now do? I can do a master's and still be a teacher if I want because I still want to impact these students. And it will only work if they see that you're moving up and they can actually listen to you. So just those conversations kind of pushed me. And then right after finishing my first degree, I went straight into my master's. I did a master's in mathematics. All right. Um, how I finance that? The scholarships that I got for undergrad, all the scholarships, all the money that I had on the portal. I know you was not going to give me back that money. Of course, you will, you will collect <laughs> money. Don't really give out money. Don't right? give out. <laughs> so, because you had all the money for me, I was like, hmm, master's doesn't sound like a bad idea. Okay. So I went straight into the master. So that was the remainder of the money that paid for undergrad. I used it to finance master, my master's degree. And it could cover boarding for the two years that I did the master's degree for just the same. Mm -hmm. So that's what I meant when I said that I was really blessed and I mm -hmm. did what I did with the article that was written about me. So I really had to give a lot of thanks to meeting the people that I met on the right where I needed to meet them because that can't be just sheer luck, it can't be just coincidence, something bigger must be happening there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and all I mean. and also the fact that you 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 worked hard and had the grades that's um something major as well. Yes. You know, because yeah. without those grades um I do I'm not sure you'd be getting as much help as you would have. So I looked at it and I was like hmm this first semester thing doesn't seem to write and I failed that course. All right, I need to do better next semester. Next semester came, I ended up failing two courses. I was like, what? Two courses. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's when I was like, okay. I so what was know. happening at that time? I have no clue. But, um, <laughs> I, what I can say is that in second semester, I decided that I was going to go into student leadership. Oh. But it was not the student leadership, so I'm not going to blame it on that. So <laughs> at this point, I know a student, um, I know, and a student I'm working, I know in student, student leadership because I was the president of my faculty for the upcoming year, based on how the elections were. And then I was also on teaching practice. So there were several oh, things going right. on. You know, several balls in the air. Like, but then I was like, okay, I need to do this. So the second year came, you know, I was like, hero, you're not know, feeling no more course. It's not going to happen. And as a student leader, you know, I was like, I need to be setting an example. I can't be a student leader and be failing courses. How will that look on the student population? So in second year, I continued. I had no courses for first semester, no courses for second semester. And I was like, okay, I like how this feels. And at this time, I was even now doing much more because here I was uh, ambassador for Taylor Hall while I was the president of the dance society at Taylor Hall. I was the student leader president at SciTech. I was involved in um, volunteering a lot of other places. So I was really all over the place, but I just had to make sure that that one area that is so that is very important, the reason why I'm at you, I had to make sure that that was done. So you're presently doing um, a PhD in engineering. Tell me yeah. about your research. All right. So my research, hmm. All right, as Isaac Newton said, if you're not able to explain it to the small basics like just yes. a chance playing with a toy, 
can you really and truly do understand <laughs> what you're doing? So let's see if I can explain. Go ahead, it. yes. All right. All right. So what I'm looking at is um control systems and what are control systems? I think it's straightforward systems that can be controlled. So let's look at some basic control systems. For example, we can look at sprinklers, right? Some persons would have sprinklers at home and it will come on at a particular time. Let's say early morning and late evening because you don't want to water during the during day. day. Mm -hmm. So that would be an example of what you would say an open loop system because it just comes on regardless. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, if it is that it rains, the sprinkler will detect, the sensor in the sprinkler now would detect that it's the line is already moist. Mm -hmm. So right. it, doesn't, it wouldn't bother to come on. Mm -hmm. And that would be an example of a closed loop system. All right. So this is just an example of how control systems work. Mm -hmm. So I want to use this control system now to model a rotary kiln and a rotary kiln is just the machine that is used to generate um to make cement that a person's used to build a house or even bauxite that is later then converted into aluminum or even lime right oh. so i want to use these control systems i want to use two particular control system methods to improve the efficiency and the efficacy of the plant and wanting to improve the efficiency and efficacy is that I want to reduce the expenses in such a way that it can even reduce the cost of these things. No. Can get mm -hmm. things cheaper then, of course, that can have an impact on the housing market or mm -hmm. whatever impact it can possibly have. So I just want to see how best you can make that contribution. Mm -hmm. So I now want to use the mathematics to get that done. Mm -hmm. the transition from math and into engineering. Because a lot of persons will be like, Oh, you like that's math and that's engineering. Engineering just because when people hear engineering, they naturally just go, Oh, so mm -hmm. at NASA, and I'm like, All right, <laughs> okay, that's not what I'm saying. But <laughs> with the math and the engineering comes together, it comes course. together. Mm -hmm. Engineering is all about problem solving, whatever the problem is, it's about solving it, and that's where the math comes in. Mm. And I enjoy being a problem solver as much as I enjoy just delivering the content okay. to the student for them to understand as well. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm planning to do for my PhD research. Okay. Um, before you go though, what message would you like to leave for our young, you know, young people, especially persons who are, you know, living in less than ideal circumstances? What I would say is and I'm going to say this because even yesterday, I saw a random young lady on campus. Yesterday, Saturday. Friday, sorry. So Friday I was on campus and I saw a random young lady and I stopped her and I was like, what are you studying? She told me, okay. She said she ideally wanted to do medicine. So I'm like, so why aren't you trying for medicine? It's expensive. So I'm like, but there are several scholarships that exist and so many other avenues you could take. What about the Cuba option? What about... And she said she, she has no idea what I'm talking about. She has not heard mm -hmm. these. She do not know where to find scholarships. So what I would say to, just like I said to her, is that if you sit down, you keep your mouth closed, you will not be able to be a part of conversations. And if you are not a part of conversations, you cannot learn some of the things that exist. Because there are several scholarships that I can tell you about for a fact that UE offers that is not granted every year because students do not apply for them. Mm -hmm. So I always say to them, start. Once you start, you get through. There's always a way to get through. The hardest part of it is to start. Some mm -hmm. persons might say to finish is up. The hardest part is to start. Once you start, there are several avenues. Have conversation. Networking is just as important as anything else. You are focused on using social media to find out what's going on up there, what's the latest trend. Mm -hmm. And you can trend about polar for days. No, you can network for days. I mean, you can have links for years, mm -hmm. right? Just by just a simple conversation. Somebody can say, okay, all right, I met I met John Tom the other day, and based on what John Tom was saying, I think he can 
do we have any scholarship do we have any scholarship that we could give to John um, or do we have any support that we could offer to John? These are the different things that exist. So I would say just don't keep your mouths close. If you have a question, ask it. Do not be afraid of what the answer is. Mm -hmm. Because despite what the answer is, you will still learn something from that conversation. So go out there, don't be afraid to put yourself out there, don't be afraid to be judged. This is what the, that's what the world has to offer. And if you're afraid of being judged, then might as well you say that you're afraid of being alive. Mm -hmm. Once you're alive, you will be judged, you will go through struggles. We don't get to not make struggles in life, but we get to choose the struggles that we want to face. And that's one of the things. So once you choose those struggles, how you want to choose it, then... So you're presently um, lecturing at University of the West Indies? Yes, presently. I'm currently lecturing at the Faculty of Engineering at UWE. And mm -hmm. of course, that motivation comes from, I think most persons would say, because my father lectured engineering. <laughs> You're going to follow too. Follow that you monkey. I mean, it wasn't a decision to say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. It just happened, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because after I finished my master's degree, I left UWE completely, I left Kingston completely, and I went to Mobe. I was lecturing at Sam Sharp Teachers College because I didn't want to leave JC. I was like, how am I going to leave these students that I want to impact? And of course, I had to, I had to find some wiggle way or some wiggle room or some excuse to say, okay, if I'm just impacting these 500 students because they come through my hands, but if I'm teaching teachers to go into the world to teach students, then that's even a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. So I think you should do this one. So that's what happened. So I went to some sharp teachers college where I was training teachers, of course. Um, so I had people on teaching practice. I was supervising students for research and a lot of stuff. One of the things that excited me too, as well on my journey, was that when I went to the interview for the scholarship, for the math and education scholarship, I had to sit across from the director at the time was Dr. Benjamin and there was another lady Pauline Baker and Evan Grandstand so there were three who were in the interview while working at JTEC I was working with Evan Grandstand oh. at that. while at Samshark uh, there was a student that was supposed to be externally assessed mm -hmm. when I went to external ass um, assessment that was Dr. Benjamin and that was Miss Pauline and I was like oh, what? all familiar faces what is going <laughs> on? Of course, we exchange words and everything. <laughs> oh, so who did you do all that? So of course, you know. Yeah. So continue the conversation. So I was grateful, and I could definitely tell them that hey, your program is actually helping students. It's definitely making a difference. Made a difference in my life. It made a difference in another friend of mine's life because both of us started you at the same time to do the math with education, and we're both educators now. Mm -hmm. so it is really helping us to make a difference out there to change our life to make an impact so the opportunities exist it's mm -hmm. just a matter of being prepared to meet those opportunities mm -hmm. I think that's the last thing I have to say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it was a pleasure talking to you Ramon and um, continue to impact our youth you know Continue to change your lives for the better and all the best um, in your PhD and your research. <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> um, I'll continue to do what I can to impact as much lives as I can, inspire as much as I can, because mm -hmm. really, um, making it by myself really and truly says nothing, but when I can help, which is why I became a teacher, when I can help others to say, okay, if I can do it, you can do it too. Mm -hmm. I'm not much better than you. My situation was not better than yours, or my situation was not more awful, right? You can also do it. So I'm going to continue to thrive in that way. And I also want to thank you for the opportunity to be here to share my experience, to share my story, because I love this program. I've been watching a couple of the episodes before, and I feel. I see where it's really impacting a lot of birth 
of course, have already liked and subscribed. And yes, did. thank you. <laughs> I'll continue to share. I'll continue to yes. like. Yes, please. Continue to get because this is one of the programs that we definitely need students or people overall, not just the students, not just children. But the program is doing great. And as I said, I love what you're doing. So thank you as well. Okay.